Good evening, you're viewing a presentation from the Agency for Public Information. I'm Sheridan Lewis. On this evening's program, the UWI Open Campus widens the service offered to locals. A parade is staged in honor of the Queen's birthday and the first cohort on the Go Teacher program graduates. These stories are coming up, but first let's join Nellie's Cupid for Newswatch. Good evening, welcome to News Watch for Tuesday, June 14th, 2016. I am Nelly Skippet, thanks for joining us. 20 new laboratory confirmed cases of the Zika virus infection from samples collected between May 23rd and June 6, 2016 have been found here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Included in these cases is one pregnant woman. The Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment has implemented the necessary care and monitoring of the pregnant patient and her unborn baby. To date, 108 serum samples have been sent to the Caribbean Public Health Agency for Zika testing. 15 of the most recent confirmed cases have come from Bekwe, one each from Lodge Village, Indian Bay and Leyu, and two of unknown addresses. These recent cases have increased the overall number of laboratory confirmed cases to a total of 28. The Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Simone Kiza Beach, reiterates that it is critical that citizens continue to take all measures to protect themselves from mosquito bites and that they work feverishly towards source reduction, which is critical in the fight against Zika. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the government of Ecuador is engaged in dialogue on the Zero Hunger Initiative. This was disclosed by Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries and Rural Transformation, the Honorable Sabota Caesar. Minister Caesar was at the time delivering the feature address at the graduation ceremony of the first cohort of Ecuadorian students from the Teach English Caribbean program. This morning I had a very lengthy conversation with a parliamentarian from the government of Ecuador, Maria Augusta Kaye. And uh, the issue that we were discussing coming out of Ecuador is the Zero Hunger Initiative. And the government and people of Ecuador are very passionate about reducing hunger and undernourishment in our hemisphere. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have joined the initiative and we are working together, the government and people of Ecuador, of Venezuela, through our South-South Corporation to ensure that we have a hunger-free hemisphere. It goes to show that in today's world, there is still a space for countries to work together. And many of the successes that we see in this hemisphere taking place begins with great minds and sometimes what appears to be a very small vision. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, like many countries globally, is on a mission to eradicate hunger by 2025. The Zero Hunger Program is an initiative of the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization and was launched by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2012. Vincentians are invited to a town hall meeting to be held at the Methodist Church Hall in Kingston. The meeting will be hosted by the CARICOM Commission on Marijuana in collaboration with the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The meeting forms part of a series of consultations which will discuss marijuana use. 
CARICOM Ambassador Ellsworth John says the commission was established in light of the movement by a number of countries to legalize marijuana for medicinal purposes. The ambassador spoke of the social and economic value of the plant, noting that a number of CARICOM states have expressed interest in exploring the possibility of exporting marijuana for medicinal use. The Caribbean, it is an area, an agricultural area, and a pharmaceutical area that the member states in the Caribbean feel we have some advantages because of our climate, um, because of our topography, uh, that lends itself um, to growing that particular um, herb. And in terms of medicinal marijuana, I think this is something that has to be done in a very controlled environment. The production, the growth, the production, the processing, um, changing the marijuana to, to oils, tablets, seeds, whatever the process is, is something that has to be done in a controlled environment. So it, it, it would be, it's a, it's a very important um, discussion that we will be having. The town hall meeting will be held on Wednesday, June 15, 2016 at the Methodist Church Hall in Kingston and will run from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Meanwhile, there will be a focus group session during the day from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. The group sessions will comprise the youth, students, medical practitioners, religious organizations, and non-governmental organizations. All are invited. That is all the time we have on Newswatch this evening. Thanks for joining us. I am Nelly Skupid. The API presentation continues. This carnival don't become a statistic. Don't become a part of the 1.2%. Don't become that one in 10. Don't let a moment of indiscretion be the deciding factor for the rest of your life. Enjoy the season, jump, dance, play mass, catch the vibe, but don't, don't, don't catch, catch the, the vibe. vibe. Welcome back. A parade was held here recently in honor of the official birthday of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The Queen celebrated her 90th birthday in fine style, and locally, a number of incensions gathered to be a part of the Diamond Jubilee. Sharish John tells us more. Queen Elizabeth II, Britain's longest reigning monarch, celebrated her 90th official birthday on Saturday, June 11, 2016. The Queen, who ascended the throne in 1953 upon the death of her father, King George VI, is also the world's oldest reigning monarch and the longest reigning queen in world history. As part of the celebrations to mark this momentous occasion, the traditional Trooping the Colour Parade featuring soldiers in ceremonial uniforms took place at Horse Guard Parade in front of the former Royal Palace at Whitehall in central London. In St Vincent and the Grenadines, celebrations were held at the Old Montrose Police Station where members of the local constabulary including the Royal St Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force and Auxiliary, the Coast Guard Service and the Cadet Force took part in a symbolic parade which was led for the first time in this country's history by a female parade commander, Assistant Superintendent of Police, Juliana Childs. Her Excellency, the Governor General's Deputy, Suzanne Duggan, conducted the ceremonial inspection of the troops and received all homage on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen. Following the symbolic ceremony, a toast to the Queen was held on the grounds of the Old Montrose Police Station, where Commissioner of Police Michael Charles offered remarks on behalf of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force. Commissioner Charles also commended the parade commander for conducting an excellent parade. Today is indeed a great day. In the history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as we celebrate 
another official birthday of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. As you know, she is celebrating her 90th birthday and her 64th year as reign as Queen of, of Great Britain and the Commonwealth. It's amazing how this magnificent lady has been loved throughout the world by her humility and she's loved not only in Great Britain and throughout the Commonwealth but the world over. I mentioned that today is a, a great day in St. Vincent and Grenadines, yes, representing Her Majesty the Queen is a lady, the Governor General's Deputy, Mrs. Susan Duggan, representing the OECS Assembly, another lady, Honorable Rennie Baptiste. We have in our midst Lady Anchobas. And this morning, on the parade ground, for the first time in the history of St. Vincent and Grenadines, a female conducted the Queen's Birthday Parade. And I'm honored to say that the first time in the history of St. Vincent and Grenadines that the commissioner who took the parade, the wife of the, the, par the parade commander is the wife of the commissioner of police. So it's good, to, it's good that we can celebrate these historic occasions as we celebrate with Her Majesty the Queen. God save the Queen. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzales gave a brief historical overview of the relationship between Britain and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Prime Minister Gonzales also noted that although he is not a monarchist, due recognition must be given to Queen Elizabeth II for the role she plays as this nation's sovereign. Britain assumed the suzerainty of this country in 1763 at the Treaty of Paris and for that entire period until today save and except for three or four years in the 1770s when the French temporarily seized possession of our lands that this country has had the British monarch as our sovereign. And it had been imposed by, through conquest and settlement, but in 2009 it is fair to say that the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines gave popular political legitimacy in a referendum for Her Majesty, which was hitherto a position occupied de jure by law. And throughout the world where Her Majesty is the, the queen, in the United Kingdom and several countries in the Caribbean and some countries in the Commonwealth. The most of the countries in the Commonwealth now are not, do not have Her Majesty as the sovereign, the most populous one. India, there is a homegrown ceremonial non-executive president. But the Queen is nevertheless acknowledged as the head of the Commonwealth, even though there are Commonwealth countries who do not have her as their sovereign lady. And by all objective accounts, Her Majesty has played a very important role 
in several seminal events during her reign. Particularly, the record will show that she sided with those in South Africa who wanted majority rule and who struggled for majority rule and she felt the time had come and in fact the record shows that she was unimpressed with Margaret Thatcher's efforts to hold back the tide. Of course Margaret Thatcher herself had to give in to the tide of liberation. And, and Her Majesty has been a stabilizing force in, in, in Britain and in the Commonwealth. She has been given long life. She's the longest serving queen, longest serving monarch, longer than the former record holder, Queen Victoria, after whom we have called Victoria Park, where you will have Uncle Skinny's celebration today. And this is how everything is intertwined in life and uh, in living. The, my experience as Prime Minister over the last 15 years plus is that the communications between ourselves and the palace have always been very dignified and respectful. And uh, I happen to know from personal conversation with Her Majesty and other officials at the palace that Her Majesty holds in very high regard the people of the Caribbean, including St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Of course, in Britain, there are millions of Caribbean people and persons of descent, of Caribbean descent. So that it's now, as I said, a multicultural world. And we come to celebrate her 90th birthday and to thank her for her service. Of course, I know some of you are listening, you may be saying, well, Ralph is not a monarchist, and which is true, but she is the Queen of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and as her Prime Minister, she has to be accorded every single respect, and she, her, her role has to be acknowledged and supported. I want to wish her longer life and I want to have it communicated to her that we admire her very much and that we love her as we love the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. God save the Queen and the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you. Meanwhile, Her Excellency the Governor General's Deputy, Suzanne Duggan, offered a toast to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. First of all, let me commend the Commissioner of Police and the members of the Constabulary for a wonderful parade and an excellent rendition or excellent renditions in honor of the official birthday of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Well done. Today we join the United Kingdom and other countries of the Commonwealth to celebrate a remarkable milestone. To be 90 is a great achievement and to serve with dignity and strength as head of the Commonwealth of Nations for over 63 years as the longest serving monarch is truly outstanding. 
I now ask you to rise. and raise your glasses in a toast to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen. The Queen, the Queen. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I'm Sharish John. Two islands and keys are waiting to be discovered. Take a look at us now. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Welcome back. As new students prepare to embark on their tertiary level education, the UWI Open Campus of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is making a strong case for students to consider taking up studies at the Open Campus. In an interview with the API, officials from the campus opined that the Open Campus is a better alternative for students who are looking to study and work from the comfort of their home at very affordable rates. Here's more in the following interview. Good evening and welcome to another presentation from the Agency for Public Information. This evening we have in studio with us two representatives from the UWI Open Campus in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This evening we'll talk all things University of the West Indies. You have you ever wondered how you will of course be qualified to enter the university? All this and a whole lot more on this evening's brief segment on this part of our program this evening. Our ladies, good evening. Welcome to our program. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Okay, let us first begin just by establishing a bit, a bit of a background sort of about the UWI Open Campus in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you. As I think your, your viewers will know, the, we have had the outreach arm of the University of the West Indies for a number, I think well over 30 years. That building, at that everyone knows, that's UE Center. However, over the years, the function of that um, building has changed. We originally started off being the extramural department, which was, I think, um, under the auspices of Mona Campus. Then we became the School of Continuing Studies, we became UE Dyke, UE Deck, and so on. So in other words, the university has always had a presence in throughout the Caribbean. In um, 2008, it, the decision was made to create a fourth campus, which is called the Open Campus. We all know of Mona in Jamaica, St. Augustine in Trinidad, Cayfield in Barbados. The Open Campus really is the virtual arm of the university. It's where you can do your certificates, your diplomas, your degrees, remaining at home simply with simply with an um, access to the internet. I, I, and I was going to say with a laptop, but I was saying the other day, soon we'll be able to do our degrees on our phone. So we say access to the internet really is a crucial um, bit of it, and of course a computer so that you can do your work. So it really is the open, the open university aspect really of the University of the West Indies. Well, it's around that time when students are preparing for exams, and then of course you have to think about the next step. And for us to even begin to talk about what programs you offer, we have to no doubt look at uh, the qualifications. Uh, what, what is needed at the entry level for you to qualify to do the program? To get into the University of the West Indies, all of the campuses, you need to have five, I'm going to date myself by saying O levels, but CSEC, CXCs, uh, two of which should be at A level. So you talk about five subjects, and of the five, two should be advanced standing. Now that's the matriculation for the University of the West Indies. However, at the open campus, we say to folks, apply if you have three O levels, four, five, no A levels, you know, an associate's degree and so on. Wherever you are, there is going to be a place for you at the open campus because we offer certificates, we offer diplomas, we offer um, degrees, degrees, associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and Doctor. recently we're offering doctorates. So when you apply, the admissions section, which try to fit you, 
into where you can go. So you might apply, um, you want to do a degree, but you don't have the, the five O levels. Well, we say, well, we offer the same thing at a diploma level or at a certificate level. And that way you can ladder up to where you really want to be. So we encourage you to apply and then you would see where you can fit. Let's now look at some of the programs that are currently being offered and some of the programs which will be brought on as part of this new academic year. Well, we also have what we call both undergrad programs, grad programs, and continuing and professional education programs. Just last year, the university started the doctoral programs, and you can do a doctor, an EDD, as we call it, in educational leadership, in education systems and schools. As Mrs. Dalrymple would have mentioned before, we do certificates, we do diplomas. So we also broaden the area of management studies to now include human resources management, finance, marketing, which are all components of general general management studies. Um, previously, all we did was management studies. Two of our best programs, as in overly subscribed programs, I should say, would be the youth development and the early childhood programs. We're seeing a lot of people going into them who um, are teaching at preschools or would like to get into preschools and with the emphasis on early childhood education there definitely is an interest in becoming more qualified so it's not just somebody simply saying oh you know I like children I'm going to go get a job at a preschool you can actually now be qualified and what is really of importance to us and one of probably one of the best aspects of open campus is the laddering system that Mrs. Dalrymple alluded to earlier where if you don't have the requirements you can come in and if you start a certificate level you can literally work your way right up to a doctoral level. There are lots of new programs, um, way too many to mention. We're doing financial management, we're doing international management. We do encourage students if they are interested to go online to our website www.open.uwi.edu and all the programs are there as new programs are added to be rolled out for new academic years. Those programs are going to be listed online. Our entire process is online. Let's now look at uh, some of the benefits, uh, of course. Uh, one which will stand out is that of cost in terms of being um, an affordability, uh, being at home and, and being enrolled and basically having it all at, at available at your, your fingertips. Uh, if you can just uh, speak to us about the affordability of the programs. Well, I'm going to ask Camille to talk about the affordability, but it's something that I feel so excited about because it really is affordable. But before we get into that, one of the benefits, because you mentioned benefits in terms of affordability, one of the benefits is that you can stay in your job. You know, very often we want to go to study, but the thought of giving up your job, what if when I come back I can't get back a job, I'd rather stay. You can stay in your job and pursue your dreams at the same time. You're at home, you have the support of your family, you have um, your mortgage to pay, your car payments and all that, so you want to be able to know there's an income coming in. Of course, the challenge is to be able to study while you have to also commit to all of these other things. That is one of the challenges. But the, the benefits far outweigh those challenges because you can stay in your job, as I said, stay with your family and have the support and still do your studies. The open campus, it means that you can spread your, your studies over a period of time. Yeah. So you want to do, take four years, five years to do a, a bachelor's degree. It depends on how many courses you do per semester. So I'll let Camille tell you a little bit about the, the cost. We're one of the best deals out there. I say so without hesitation. Currently, an undergrad program would cost you less than $30,000. That's EC dollars. That is EC dollars. You do 30 courses, and each course is $972. What is also exciting is that you don't have to have all the monies up front. So it's not that you're going off to school and you have to have this lump sum. You pay by semester. So this semester you decide, I can only afford to do two courses. You sign up for two, you pay for two. Next semester, maybe you get a scholarship, maybe you get a windfall. I can do four courses, I sign up, I pay for four courses. So basically, the fact that you pay by the semester and the university allows you to do anywhere from one to five courses per semester, means that you can manage your funding. It means that when it comes to even loans, because the interest is calculated on 
the portion that is drawn down, you pay less interest because you'll only pay as you draw down each semester. So it, it really is a fabulous deal when it comes to that. Well, you, you've just mentioned uh, uh, scholarships, and I'm sure persons who are in tune to this interview uh, would say, well, I get assistance from the government if I decide to, to go abroad to, to get that. What, what sort of assistance or scholarships are available? The Economically Disadvantaged Student Program is available to students who also study at the Oakland campus. It is not simply for students who study abroad. So they can go and they can get their loans. There's actually several options. The credit unions are offering special loans. GECU, for instance, has the loan as you earn, where you can borrow, I think, to a maximum of 30,000, and the interest rate is, is pretty reasonable. There, there are other credit unions. The Open Campus has bursaries that are available, both to first-time students as well as continuing students. We have the Mustique Charitable Trust bursary that offers three bursaries per year to new students. We have the Correa's Hazel's bursary that offers students offers scholarships and bursaries to second, second, second semester. semester continuing mm -hmm. students. And we do have other bursaries in the works that hopefully we should be able to roll out in time for the 2015-2016 intake, which would be in August. The uh, students can also approach the Government Services Commission's department. They offer tuition one year at a time. And the university itself has sco several scholarships. There's the AFUWI. Um, it's about three or four different scholarships that our own open Absolutely. campus students have gotten. And these are scholarships that are worth between two and three thousand US dollars. And you simply draw down on them as necessary. And Geku has been offering mm -hmm. bursaries as well. Uh, scholarships. Too. Well, full scholarships. scholarships. And we're very pleased that Three, the three that were offered were also taken by open campus students. So mm -hmm. there are many financing options out there, as well, of course, the self-financing, because the other persons, depending on their individual incomes, can afford to finance themselves simply because it's on a semesterly basis. That's right. That, that really makes a big difference yeah. because then you can... You can manage yeah. as you go. You manage. You manage you your finances as you go. You yes. know, and the other thing is because the open campus, we, we we say that we are responsive to our students' needs. Is that sometimes something can come up? You know, whether it's illness, whether it's you lose your job, or you just can't manage time-wise. You can't take a leave of absence. You can say, well, this semester I can't manage. In other words, we we really try as best we could to make the our courses, our program student-centered. Of course, people do have to pay because sometimes we do run into a sort of a situation where, you know, somehow our students really struggle and, 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 and we feel it for them. But the, the university, it's a service and it's a program that you often that you, ha you do have to pay, as you would have to pay for any university. But I don't think you can get a better package anywhere, financially speaking, as, well, as long as the services. Now, quite a number of people do courses online, a number of students, because... A lot of times we proctor exams for other universities. But the thing is, that's all you, you are. You are a number on the computer. But at the open campus, even though it is online, you can come into the campus physically and speak to a face. You can speak to someone there who can help you through. Whether it's helping you to register online, whether you're having difficulty in choosing your courses, there's somebody there. The library, you have um, librarians who can hook you into the libraries of the other campuses. So even though you're here, you're not disadvantaged. We also offer to our students opportunities for lectures, for panel discussions, for the literary fair. In other words, even though you're online, we try to make it the university experience a university experience. It's not just you just sit at home in the pajamas and you do a course. You are, in fact, we encourage our students to become involved at the campus. There are also opportunities for travel because this year we had an open campus student who went on an exchange program to Japan for a month. Right. So it's not even just stay at home. The opportunities are there for travel through the arrangements that the university as a whole has with other universities around the world. And we are going to be seeing more, more of those exchange programs and they are open both to students at the open campus as well as the physical campuses because the only difference between us and the physical campuses is literally a brick and mortar building that there you will go to class but all the benefits are available whether you are here or you are there. Yeah.
What is important in, in all of this, especially when you're doing uh, online studies and so forth, is the whole uh, is the whole issue of accreditation. And uh, the University of the West Indies is, is a brand. It's, it's a brand that is recognized. And in fact, uh, there's a school of thought that when you're educated at the University of the West Indies, that you're properly educated. Oh, I'm sure you would like to speak to the whole idea of the accreditation and it being accredited and, and everything like no, that. I, let me just say, there, there's a difference between being recognized and being accredited. Acc the accreditation process, it's it's almost like a technical process that you are accredited in your own countries. For example, University of the West Indies, Mona, St. Augustine, Cave Hill, and Open. We all had to go through our own accreditation exercise. So at the, because we are new, the Open Campus, we just went through this in 2013. 2013, we got accredited, right, where um, we are attached to um, the Barbados, I think, accreditation board. So they would come in, do their, we did a self-study right. to make sure they see where are our gaps and so on. And every year we have to go through the accreditation exercise where they check to see are we staying on course. Mm -hmm. So in terms of saying this is this is a quality education that we have put our stamp on. Now of course you have the accreditation in terms of maybe the um, school of business being accredited with their affiliates the School of the uh, Medicine, yeah. Engineering and so on, you have those kind of professional accreditation, all of which the University of the West Indies has. But I think beyond the accreditation is our recognition that we have across the world. Um, the, the university started off as a college of the University of London, way back in 1948, I yes, believe. 1948. And then since then, we have, you know, first became, like, medicine was the main thing at Mona, and engineering at St. Augustine. Now you can do medicine at all three campuses. What is going to happen in the near future is that we are going to be able to offer them one university idea. It's, it's the single university space, basically, is what it's called. So I can want to do something in my own field as social worker. I might want to do some sort of an upgrade. I can sit on that uh, upper tower building and I can sit in a classroom, a virtual classroom, with students in Jamaica, in, in, um, in Trinidad, in Barbados. So you're going to be able to actually take, you know, be able to interact with students across the university. I think that our, our current vice chancellor is very much, very much enthused about the one university concept. So that is something that is coming. And having said that, um, perhaps it's the right time to say that we are going to be renovating our building so that we can offer that kind of service. We can offer more teleconf um, I'm, I'm dating myself again, Ms. <laughs> Mrs. Lacrom. Um, video conferencing video conference, facilities, yeah. um, improved laboratory facilities, and so on. So we're hoping to start that new building um, this year, the middle of this year, yeah. hopefully, and that um, so that we can offer so much more service. Because really, um, I think the Open Campus prides itself in the service that we offer to our students. And uh, just as we uh, begin to wrap up our session this evening, if uh, you can tell persons how they can contact uh, the university, uh, how persons can get in touch to know what's really happening and to be kept abreast of all the programs. In addition to going online, where all the information is easily accessible, once you have an internet connection, you can walk in. Uh, we are located at Murray's Road, right across from the Peace Memorial Hall. And you walk in, you can see us at the main office, we call General Administration. Anybody at front desk can speak with you. If you wish to call, you can get us at 784-456-1183. And we are Mondays to Thursdays, 8.30 to 4.30. And on Fridays, we are 8.30 to 3.30. Okay, and perhaps I can add that there's also another number which is 784-485-6606. That's the media center where you can get in touch with the lab technicians or media person over at the, um, the media center. So there are two numbers that you can reach and anybody who answers that phone would be willing to help you. Thank you very much, ladies, and thanks for joining us on our program this evening. Our topic of discussion was the University of the West Indies and its operations here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. On behalf of the entire team, thank you so much for viewing. Have a good evening. St. 
Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Welcome back. On July 4, 2014, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, met with the President of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, while on an official visit to enhance their growing cooperation on political, economic and trade matters. It was during that visit that President Correa made a commitment to send Ecuadorian English teachers to the Caribbean to improve their English proficiency and pedagogical skills through the expansion of the existing Go Teacher program. The first cohort arrived in the Caribbean in the first week of November 2015 to pursue the seven-month-long program. The graduation was held on June 7. Ashisha Sam tells us more. 44 Ecuadorian teachers are now equipped with the necessary skills to be better teachers and the speakers of the English language following the completion of the seven-month-long Teach English Caribbean program. The Teach English Caribbean program is an expansion of the Go Teacher program USA to the Caribbean. It is a mutual agreement between the Prime Minister of Ecuador Rafael Correa and Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. The program, which commenced on November 9, 2015, was designed to improve the English proficiency and pedagogical skills of these Ecuadorian English teachers. Tuesday, June 7, 2016, saw a graduation ceremony to mark the completion of the first cohort of the Teach English Caribbean program in St. Vincent and the Grenadines at Lecture Theatre 2 at the Villa Campus of the Community College. Academic Coordinator of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College, Janice Dean, gave an overview of the program. These students have participated in the Teach English Caribbean program and now hold certificates of proficiency in both the ESL English as a Second Language and TESOL Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages. Today is a day of firsts. This is the first cohort of Ecuadorian students to graduate from our institution with certificates in ESL as well as TESOL. This is also the first time that St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College has ever, ever offered such a program. It is also the first time that St. Vincent and the Grenadines has ever participated in such a unique experience, an experience which has not only expanded our diplomatic ties, but has also offered quality educational opportunities to countries in South America. The Ecuadorian students have been with us for the past seven months, from the 7th of November 2015 to, to the 7th of June 2016. Their program of study was divided into two major sessions, English as a Second Language, which was of three months duration, and Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages, which was also a three-month stint. The final month of the program was dedicated to a three-week practicum where students taught in a number of secondary and primary schools in Kingstown and Villa area. Like any other tertiary program, a research project was mandated as an academic requirement. Subsequently, they did a capstone project based on an aspect of research in education that would have implications for future seminal work in Ecuador. The ESL courses were linked to language learning acquisition and in included subjects such as reading, writing, listening, oral presentation, conversation, language structure, and phonology. The college's state-of-the-art language laboratory enabled students to practice the four language skills, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. The program sought for a multiplicity of meaningful contexts which would enable oral proficiency in English and towards this end, the Ecuadorian students engaged in oral presentations in English on their country, on the provinces, on their provinces or neighborhoods in which they lived in Ecuador, in which they lived in Ecuador. They also conducted research 
on places of interest in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and gave presentations on these. Additionally, they participated in activities such as debates, expositions, conducted interviews, and conducted interviews, sorry, with business owners and, and later gave presentations on these in class. These courses in the ESL program tremendously helped the practitioners to improve their proficiency in the English language. In terms of the TESOL program, our students took courses in the pedagogical aspects of language learning and teaching. They were exposed to current and conventional theories of language learning acquisition and teaching practice. They were taught based on the biography-driven instructional approach by Dr. Socorro Herrera. This approach focused on differentiated instruction, student-centered learning, students' biographies, and holistic development of the learner. ESL and EFL culture and language, methodology, and applied linguistics were the content areas which provided them with the knowledge and skills in this approach. Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Education, the Honorable Deborah Charles, noted that an investigation done in the year 2012 revealed that the level of the English language among Ecuadorian teachers was lower than international standards. And she is pleased that Prime Minister Gonzalez saw the need to assist the Ecuadorian teachers in this regard. She implored the first cohort of teachers in the Teach English Caribbean program to encourage their colleagues to be enrolled in the next batch of the program. Being the proactive Prime Minister that we have in St. Vincent, the Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez, he made an effort to reach out to his friends in Ecuador with the hope of one, enhancing and strengthening our own education revolution here, and also to assist the Ecuadorians with their English teaching problems. This initiative taken by Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez has brought benefits to both our countries. And I say benefits because while the teachers who are here would have acquired new skills in speaking and the teaching of English, they would have also gained valuable lessons from living and dwelling among us. And I've heard of some of your exploits while you were here. At the same time, Vincentian students here at the community college, though limited it may have been, would have interacted and formed lasting friendships with some of you. Our tutors would have memorable moments that they will cherish as a result of your being in their classes. And just like the medical college students resident in St. Vincent, you would, of course, contributed to the economy of our country. You have also been involved in our cultural activities. And I know during the Christmas vacation when we celebrated our nine mornings, I met, I saw some of you at those particular functions. So I know that you had a ball of a time. You would have been introduced to all of these cultural experiences. But above all of what you would have been exposed to in terms of our culture and the places that you would have visited, I wish that the 44 of you who have formed the very first cohort of teachers who have benefited from this training would, when you go back to your country, sell the program to your other colleagues. In other words, encourage other colleagues of yours to join in the next batch of students and be a part of this worthwhile program. I would also wish that with your newly acquired skills and the knowledge in the subject, you would inspire in your children, the students you would go back to teach, a love for the English as a second language, thus making it interesting and easier for them 
to acquire the skill of, of speaking and writing English. Lastly, I wish to you would encourage your friends and relatives to come and enjoy the same hospitality that you enjoyed while you have been here. Let them also know that between these two countries, travel would become a lot more easier very soon as we endeavor to open our international airport shortly. Director of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College, Nigel Scott, said that the Teach English Caribbean program has not been without challenge, but with the support of the Board of Governors, the staff of the SVGCC, and other relevant agencies and the personnel, the program is now successfully completed. It had been a long time in coming from the hatching of the idea between two friends, Raphael and Ralph the President of Ecuador, and the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. From the hatching to the planning beginning in 2014, there were many stops and starts, many ups and downs. Finally, in June 2015, the agreement was signed and we knew we were on the way. The road prior to the first arrivals and the road since then has not been an easy one. Over the last seven months, Deputy Director and Administrative Coordinator, Mrs. Eula Adams, and I'm going to ask you to give a special round of applause. <laughs> Academic Coordinator, Ms. Janice Dean, All of the lecturers in this program, Mr. Maloney, <laughs> Ms. Rodney, Mr. Bacchus, Ms. Bullock, Ms. Martin, who I have is there, yes. And Mrs. Sullen, who unfortunately could not be with us this afternoon, she sends her apologies. All have worked tirelessly along with the clerical staff, the students, their landlords, and friends here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, their transportation organizers, Daddy and Dexter. have all worked tirelessly to ensure a wonderful experience. It has been a myriad of highs and lows. Through it all, we have had the support of both governments and agencies in both countries, from CENICET, the Ministry of Higher Education in Ecuador, to our own Ministry of Education here. The Ministries of Foreign Affairs and Tourism here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines have all provided their fullest support, answering phone calls and emails at very strange hours in the night sometimes. Many tears have been shed, many new friends have been made, many mountains have been climbed and many valleys traversed. Yes, it has not been an easy journey, but through it all, these students have endured. It is never easy being away from family, spouses, children, some of them very young, and friends. In the midst of it all, along came April 16, 2016, and a magnitude 7.8 earthquake rocked Ecuador. The anxious hours and days that followed trying to reach relatives and friends compounded an already hectic schedule. But through it all, this amazing team of lecturers and administrative staff have continued to work tirelessly to support these students. The students have also worked very hard to support each other. We have enjoyed having this group of international students join our student body over the last seven months. They are our friends, and just as we welcomed them seven months ago, 
I welcome you today to say goodbye, farewell, until to them as we celebrate in this graduation ceremony this afternoon. In the student's response, student Gabriela Montores Lor said that the program has been very enriching for them in many aspects. Professionally, this experience helped us to learn innovative strategies that are new in our educational system. Besides, we were able to interact with native speakers who, who assisted us in improving our pronunciation, production of English, and our fluency. Personally, it allowed us to hold in high regard what we have currently know or learned at home, especially the values and lessons our parents taught us. To fend by ourselves in this beautiful country that hosted us with kindness and respect. Now, it is time to express our gratitude to all the persons who have supported us to achieve this goal. First, to the Lord for allowing us to come and go highly satisfied. <laughs> and go highly satisfied from this experience that is ending this day. To the Economics, Rafael Correa Delgado, President of the Republic of Ecuador. <laughs> for giving us the opportunity to study abroad in order to improve our skills in teaching English. The best legacy we can leave to young people is a qualifying education. All scholars have received a gift that will last forever. Thanks to the noble labor performed by the Ecuadorian government to support education, which is the most important aspect to, in the development of any country. To the Honorable Mr. Ralph, Ralph Gonzalves, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who agreed to carry the program out. Without his endorsement, this educational venture could not have been a reality. Moreover, we could not have gotten to know this warm island, as well as to reach the goal of becoming better English speakers as well as teachers. Every night in my dreams, I see you, I feel you, that is how I show you, go on. Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries and Rural Transformation, the Honorable Saboto Caesar, who delivered the featured address at the graduation ceremony of the Teach English Caribbean program, described the program as a great expression of sovereignty. We are here as a result of a very creative and innovative policy. The President of Ecuador, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, decided to sow a very important seed. That seed was not sown in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but it started with a very brief discussion in Ecuador. It grew into a beautiful plant, and today we are bearing the fruits, and we are seeing the fruits. And any one of us who would have listened to our dear sister Gabriela would leave here knowing that it was a success. <laughs> Ecuador has a population of on about 16 million. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, just over 110,000. And I am happy that both nations would have come together in a great expression of their sovereignty. Some nations would use their sovereignty to build bombs and to fight wars. But Ecuador and St. Vincent and the Grenadines 
we are using our sovereignty to make this world a better place. The Ecuadorian students received two certificates, one for the Teach English Caribbean program and another for participating and successfully completing the community outreach program. Several students also received several prizes and awards. The Teach English Caribbean program was also carried out at the Cave Hill campus of the University of the West Indies in Barbados and also at the Dominica State College. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I am a We've come to the end of this evening's presentation from the Agency for Public Information. On behalf of the API News team, thank you for viewing. I'm Sheridan Lewis. Good evening.